So we're back with Roy McIntyre and we're going to have a, a great chat about flying and living in uh, in the Falklands with the F3. So Roy, how did you get first posted to the Falklands? Well, I actually uh, had avoided the Falklands for <laughs> quite a while actually and it was, I was getting a bit of a reputation uh, simply because um, when I was on the Phantom on 43 Squadron I was due to go and then I was posted to the F3 the F3 wasn't going down there for a while, and then just when they started to post people down and they put they deployed the, the F3 down to the Falklands, uh, I went on to the OEU, the Operational Evaluation Unit, and they didn't supply in a day. So I managed to do some escape and evasion for quite a while, but when I back to 43 in 97, they finally caught up with me, and that was going to be my first of 13 deployments down there. Wow. So, yeah. Um, well, obviously, it was just coming to the, the the Phantom was just coming to the end of its uh, service operational life, um, but they wanted to make sure that the F three was going to be supportable, that it could do the job, the engineering infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was quite a time, um, and indeed, towards the end of the Phantom's life in the Air Force, the the Watersham Wing were carrying the Falklands deployment mm. wholly on their own. And there was some sharp eyes looking across towards Gunningsby and Leeming and and uh, lookers going, well, come on, guys, when are you going to start and help us? Um, <laughs> so it did take a wee while, actually, um, before they were confident to move the airframes down. But it was just a, a one-for-one swap, i.e. four Phantoms down there. They put four F3s down there um, to do the same job, which is um, maintain the airspace integrity around the Falklands. And when you went over to the Falklands, um, did you fly over the F3s or were you in the back of a VC-10 or a Herc uh, or anything like that? I uh, know, we're down on the air bridge. Uh, they had already got them down, although they were, they obviously have to cycle airframes home um, for major servicing. Uh, and to begin with, that was done with a VC-10 and a very long transit um, and through the ascension and back. Um, latterly, they brought in a Russian civilian large aircraft, uh, <laughs> Ruslan, I think it was, um, and they could take the wings and the fin off it and pack them in the back of that, and they could just fly them all the way back to the UK in a one um, a lot more simple. Um, but to answer your question, every time I went down there, it was on the air bridge, which initially was TriStars out of Bryce, and then eventually went to a civilian contract, which produced a whole cocktail of different civilian airliners slightly more comfortable than a TriStar. But that's the first thing about, I have to say about the Falklands. It's a long way away, about 8,000 miles. And the journey to get there is a bit of a pain. It's effectively 24 hours by the time you arrive at Bryce Norton till you get off and get into your accommodation at Mount Pleasant. Um, it's a long journey. And same going home, only a little bit more stressful because you're worried about service abilities of the bridge to get you home. So... Yeah, it, it was great when you got there, but it was a bit of a pain in the travel. So uh, on that air bridge, like, uh, did you have food on board? Like, what was like the transit yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't uh, British Airways standard, but we, <laughs> we had food. And, and they had little mini video players and, and stuff like that, so you could watch a film and stuff like that. So uh, it was it was reasonable. The, the main problem is the length of time. It was about, if I remember correctly, heading southwards, it's eight and a half hours to Ascension Ooh. and seven and a half hours onwards from Ascension down to uh, the Falklands. So it's a long time to be on an aircraft. You get maybe an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on what's going on, um, just sitting in ascension in a little area known as the cage, because it is the cage. It's an open air thing, but it's enclosed to keep passengers corralled. Um, and there's a tea bar and what have you there. But yeah, it was it was a long journey down. So it was it was, it was good to get there. And of course the best bit about it um, as you approach the Falklands, generally speaking, serviceability allowed, um, the F3s would come up and intercept the air bridge. And so yes. you'd come down and you'd have um, F3s on the, on the wing, which is uh, good for everybody to see because it's a reminder of what it's all about. And of course, the um, uh, airliner coming in and they could see it from about 200 miles out. And of course, it's on a timetable on a flight plan. Um, it was a good intercept practice for the um, 
for the F3s on the ground and the um, fighter controllers, air space battle managers, um, to effect an intercept, which was just part of the, the basic job we would be doing down there. So for the folks who are not familiar with the Falklands, why were the RAF actually in the Falklands, uh, the Falkland Islands? Right, well, this all comes back from, well, mostly from the, the 1982 conflict, but it goes all the way back to the 1700s where there's an argument who, who to whom does the Falkland Islands belong? Um, and from pretty much the 17, late 1700s, uh, the United Kingdom has claimed them. Um, and obviously Spain and then Argentina have countered that, and there were um, various attempts, but the big one was in 1982 with the invasion, which was then finally repelled. Um, it must be said that the uh, armed forces pre that 1982 war were pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. It actually was 40, 40 commandos, uh, wow. Royal Marine commandos. When the Argentine um, forces invaded, it happened to be on a changeover period, so there was 80 Royal Marines there, but it still mm. wasn't enough. That was it, plus the local, effectively, TA, nothing else. Um, post the war, they, they decided they needed to have a more robust defence structure from all three services, um, and initially it was fairly basic when the Phantoms and the Harriers were down there. Um, by the time we got there, I, I became involved, um, Mount Pleasant Airport was built with much better facilities. Um, so the F3s are there as part of the air defence element, or where they're now being taken over, of course, by the Typhoon, uh, to maintain the integrity of the air airspace over the Falkland Islands um, fixed con conservation zone. But it's this area that um, effectively the Argentinians are not allowed to come into without invitation. Um, there's naval elements and there's army elements and Again, during my time, um, there were there were um, rapier fire units, so there's rapier missiles, so you had ground-based air defence. So a much more structured and much more robust um, uh, defensive system. Of course, we also had three radar stations to provide much better radar coverage than they had in the in the eighty two war. Um, so that was it, and it's a, an ongoing um, task which the typhoons are continuing with to this day.